starting off today with Vancouver Island Brewing's Nanaimo Bar Imperial Porter. This porter is their homage to the world-famous treat and one of my favorites, especially this time of year. In addition to the usual ingredients you find in a beer, they also included graham cracker and cocoa and coconut, which are three of the main flavors in the Nanaimo Bar. So today's kit is going to be the most impressive one, I think anyway. Uh, this is the Evil Mad Scientist 741 Discreet Op Amp. You may remember last year I did their Discreet 555 kit, and it turned out to be a really incredible little kit to build. And this year I decided to do the surface mount version of the giant uh, IC that they have. And the 741, uh, for those who are new to this hobby, is one of the earliest and most popular op amps ever, ever created. It was first came out back in 1967, so it's, you know, almost as old as I am. It's, it's just such a versatile little op amp. It's certainly not the best one available today, but it is still in use all over the place for any of the things that you could use an op amp for. Should we take a look at the kit? Yeah, let's take a look at the kit first, and then we'll just take a quick look at some of the supplementary information they have. So first of all, there is this four page assembly manual, which is like all their kits that I've looked at, just an incredible document, well put together. Um, a full parts list here, and very much a step-by-step -step set of instructions. Gives you a little bit of information about the in, the uh, tools and information that you're going to need. Um, solder, yep, tweezers. I have a bunch to, of different ones to choose from. Uh, flux, possibly. I have some of that back here if I need it. Um, extra fine soldering tip. Yep. Uh, what else? Not required, extra fine soldering tip, got it. Phillips head screwdriver, got it. I could probably use this one. Yeah, not much needed from the builder. Uh, because it is a surface mount kit, it's gonna be a little bit trickier. Um, they suggest that you can, if you want to, use hot air. I'm not going to, I'm going to hand solder it because I really need practice at that. Um, Magnifier, or jeweler's loop, or a microscope. I've got those kicking around. I'm going to try and do it without. Just, just to see if I can. And then, page two, they have a step-by-step -step set of instructions. All goes all the way through. Step one, step two, which components to do, all the way through, and then ends up with the mechanical stuff at the end of it, and a super basic little test circuit. Also in the box, we have all the components laid out step by step. So for each step in the instructions, it has one compartment on the uh, component tape here with just the components you need for that step all the way along. So the first bunch of resistors and capacitors, diodes, uh, NPN and PNP transistors. Here is the circuit board nice thick fiberglass board and it is a double-sided board but m the m vast majority happens on the front side they've only put a few traces on the back this is kind of neat the actual mounting screws are milled down see that it's actually recessed into the board a little bit so you can get a bit more flush on top that is kind of cool and then the eight pins are labeled for their function exactly as they are on a standard 741. And then because it's the surface mount version, it comes with a surface mount style stand. Also in the box, we have some little thumb screws and some, what are those? Those are the threaded inserts to go onto the board to allow those thumb screws to go in. But I will put those in the box and set them aside for now. So I mentioned that on their website, they have a slew of extra information about this chip, even just on the sales page. So that sales page links to, among other things, a data sheet for the 741. Now this isn't the original Fairchild Semiconductors data sheet. This is their own rewriting of it with more detail about the circuit that they have created as well, but also 
a lot of information about the 741 itself. Standard pinout, the parts list for the through-hole version of the kit, as well as for the surface mount version, which is the one that I'm playing with tonight. The schematic of the op amp. As you can see, all it is is standard components. It is a bunch of NPN and PNP transistors. It is a couple of diodes. It is a handful of resistors and one lonely little capacitor right in the middle. It shows you also the block diagram that makes up the various sections of it. So at the beginning, we have a differential amplifier where the two inputs connect to and a couple voltage offset connections. Then in the middle, there is a bias voltage generator that is followed by the gain stage and finally the output driver stage. When you break it down like that, it's a lot less intimidating than what it initially appears to be. There's another way of looking at the block diagram of it or example circuits. Again, these are straight out of the original data sheet. Very, very common configurations as well. And then finally, physical dimensions for both of the kits. They also have an online version of the assembly manual, which is the one that we got with it in the kit. And finally, an 11 page theory of operation document, which goes in a component by component basis, explaining exactly how the thing works, exactly what each component is doing. And from a beginner point of view, this is a fantastic document. If you want to learn at a really deep level, how an op amp works, this is definitely worth a read or two or three. All right, so I'm all set up here. I've got my fine tip in here and all nicely cleaned. I've got the instructions here and I'm going to be referring to them step by step fairly frequently. So I'll keep them handy. I've got the components up there. I'm going to be using this little soldering stand that I haven't used in quite a while. Mostly haven't used it because I don't do a lot of surface mount stuff. Um, but in this case, it's the perfect tool for the job. Anyway, let us open up step the first step which is a 1K resistor, actually two 1K resistors. So the first resistor in is, unsurprisingly, R1. So the typical way to do, to hand solder surface mount components is to get a little bit of solder onto the pad, give it a quick tinning, then get the component in place, just holding it in there with a pair of tweezers, remelt the solder onto the component, nudge the component into place, then let that pad cool just a little bit and solder the other end. I think that worked. This is going to be much more challenging than I remember, and again mostly because I am so horribly out of practice with surface mount soldering. So I think for subsequent components, I am going to switch to the microscope. So the next thing in is the remaining resistor, which is R2 in this case, followed by all the rest of the resistors. Certainly not beautiful, but better than the first one. So component number three, Three in here is a 51k resistor, or appears to be two of them. Yes, R3 and R12. I think I'm going to rotate it this way so that I can use the tweezers in my left hand, which is my less dexterous hand, and have the soldering iron in my right hand. I'm not sure if this is a good idea or not. Not straight, but definitely stuck down. For R12, I've added just a little bit of flux to the board, or at least I've attempted to add a little bit, and I've managed to get two and a half Rossmans worth of flux in there. Spare the flux and spoil the, spoil the project. Does it look any better at all? Next in are components labeled number 4, which are R4 and R7, which are 4.7K. This packaging system makes this really, really 
both beginner friendly and idiot proof. Since I'm not doing a soldering tutorial, montage mode engage. The next step, step seven, is to insert the surface mount nuts. So they go into the little uh, pads there and get soldered down. So that is these little guys here. So those just snap into these little holes, and they, they're not even a press fit, they're just a loose fit. And then they get soldered down. I wonder if I need a larger tip for this, or if the tip I've been using is going to be adequate. Well, it looks like it's going to work just fine. Well, they are throwing quite a bit of heat into that huge pad and that big chunk of metal, but yeah, that looks like it. Right. Let's carry on around the horn and do all those next. And that's them all soldered in, including pin 8, the no connection pin. Next step, mount the board to the lead frame with four nylon uh, spacers and then screw into it. Okay, so we'll set the four nylon spacers over those four screw holes there. And set this guy down on top and then run the screws in. Now these are machine screws that are not necessarily self-tappers, but they're being asked to tap into the nylon, or into the aluminum underneath, which is not a big deal. They can definitely do it. Steel breaks or steel can cut aluminum. But this thing is not uh, oomphy enough to do it. And it can do it with its clutch, but I am just happier to do it this way with the old manual driver and with those milled out pockets in the board that I was talking about earlier they sit down almost perfectly flush and we got a gap through there so there's no shorts in the back the final step step nine add the thumb screws so black for minus VCC red for plus VCC on pin seven they're a little tricky to get started, but once they, once they find the thread, they go in. That's easier that way, okay. Pin 7, yellow for the signal pins, um, inverting input, non-inverting input, and the output pin, pin 6. So much easier to get them started if you hold it up. It's just a matter of getting them going straight in. And then gray for the other three, for the offset N1 and N2, and for pin 8, the no connection pin. Because those ones are not always used. And of course the NC pin is not connected, so you're never going to use it. But just for completeness, there we go. So now they suggest testing it with a voltage follower circuit, the most absolutely basic circuit that you can do. You set up the plus and minus uh, power supply, and that doesn't have to be 15 volts. It could be anything, but 15 volts is you know, close to its maximum, so that's a reasonable place to test it. And then the V in should be somewhere a couple of volts inside that, 
and V out should match V in. So that acts as a buffer, high impedance input so that uh, you can drive an output to another stage of a circuit without loading down whatever's over here. However, in this case, it's just a test circuit. Let's try that. Alrighty, here is the test setup. And this is exactly that schematic there. I have the input connected to the uh, non-inverting input. I have the inverting input connected to the output. I have plus VCC connected to pin seven. I have minus VCC connected to pin four. And then there is ground in between the plus and minus voltage supplies, conveniently supplied by these two batteries here. The offsets I'm not using. And of course, the not connected pin is not connected. So coming from my power supply over here, I've got two and a half volts coming in. And on my voltage follower output, my buffer output, I also have 2.5 volts. So if I turn this down or down to 1.5 volts, that tracks down to 1.5 volts. If I bring this guy up to three volts, 2.96 volts, actually 2.99, I should be able to get pretty close to five volts with these nine volt batteries there. So I got 5.28 here and 5.31 there. So it is doing its job. Shall we see what happens if we uh, throw an AC signal at this thing? And to get our test circuit, I am going to refer to the venerable Forest Mims Engineer's Mini Notebook on Op Amp IC circuits. Since Radio Shack doesn't exist anymore, I don't feel too bad about using the online version of this, which can be found at archive.org, a link down below. Let's use the basic non-inverting amplifier. You put an AC waveform into the non-inverting input, and the output comes out bigger or smaller based on the gain that you set by the ratio between R1 and R2. So I am going to use uh, Mr. Mim's values, R1 1K and R2 10K, so we should have a gain of 11. All right, here is the test setup, which I've already verified with a traditional 741 on the breadboard here. As we saw in the Forest Mims book, we have a 10K between the output and the inverting input. We have a 1K between the inverting input and ground. Um, ground is over here, um, just to keep things neat and tidy, because, you know, neat and tidy is exactly how I do things around here. Uh, anyway, um, the power is still there and there. Here is the input. The input is coming from my function generator over here, which is currently set to a 10 kilohertz sine wave. Why 10 kilohertz? Why not? We see on the scope that we have the input signal up here and the output signal down here. Uh, let us tinker the frequency. Pretty good, huh? It's doing exactly what you would expect an amplifier to do. I don't know what else there is to say about this. It works. It is exactly this, only in a convenient surface mount package. Thanks to Evil Med Scientist for building such an awesomely ridiculous learning kit providing such excellent instructions and so much good information on their website. Um, I'll put links to that, to the Forest Mims book, um, everything else down below. If you want one of these kits, I'll put a link to that too. I don't get a kickback on it and uh, I bought this uh, months and months ago. So this is just all about fun and sharing the information. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you uh, maybe learned something more than just learning that I'm crap at soldering surface mount, but we knew that going in. Although I did get some practice in a few of those joints, you know, one or two of them, looks like something I'm slightly proud of. Anyway, um, comments and questions down below as usual. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching all year, really. Um, happy holidays, and uh, I'll talk to you later.